So in the third lecture on post-transcriptional uh, regulation, we will start with uh, transport of RNA. So what we have learned so far is capping and poly polyadenylation of the RNA, uh, splicing of the RNA, and now we are talking about uh, the spliced matured RNA coming to the cytosol. Um, a good way of looking into it is through uh, an observation which is uh, concerning uh, what is referred to as bulbian earring. So uh, most of you may already know about the salivary gland uh, uh, chromosome uh, in Drosophila. Many uh, discoveries were made uh, using the salivary gland chromosome because uh, multiple copies of the chromosome are aligned uh, in parallel. So you actually get to see the uh, chromosome under microscope and uh, you know certain bands can be seen there etc uh, so uh, physically uh, the chromosome could be mapped because of the salivary gland chromosome very similar thing uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, organism uh, it's, uh, like uh, so there uh, in their salivary gland chromosome, uh, certain proteins uh, that code for the glue proteins, uh, which attaches the uh, pupa with the larva with the uh, leaves in the tree, they are uh, synthesized in parallel in rather uh, bulk. And then uh, they come out from the chromatin template in uh, large thick uh, RNA uh, molecules and then they are organized into a ribonucleo uh, protein complex. And this complex uh, you know, uh, goes through the nuclear pore complex. And what is seen is that as it is passing through the nuclear pore complex, it kind of straightens out. So where, what you can see here uh, is uh, you know, uh, drawing from an actual electron um, a micrograph. Uh, so you can see that multiple uh, of these uh, mRNP particles are forming from the chromatin template, which has been shown in uh, here uh, in schematic. And then when they come to the nuclear pore complex, you can see that on the nuclear side, it uh, is, latches onto the, uh, the basket-like shape of the nuclear pore complex, and then it uh, straightens out, and then the mRNA are uh, ejected to the uh, cytosolic uh, side, and their ribosomes uh, ride on it. Okay, so uh, this, uh, you know, uh, from this complex three-dimensional structure to a relatively linear structure, this transition is thought to happen through what is referred to as mRNP remodeling, uh, messenger RNA protein complex remodeling. So we will come to that in a minute. So what is this, uh, you know, the basic process of uh, RNA uh, export from nucleus to cytoplasm? So, you know, the nuclear envelope, just like the cell membrane, uh, is a uh, double um, membrane, each membrane having uh, two layers of lipid. So therefore, this is an otherwise impermeable membrane other than where you have nuclear pore complexes. And uh, this nuclear pore complex uh, has a very complex structure. There are a few hundreds of different kinds of proteins. Uh, there is one ki kind of protein called the Fg nucleoporin. So the, the Fg is the short form of phenylalanine phenyl and glycine nucleoporin. Uh, they catch hold of these uh, uh, mRNP uh, complexes and uh, help in their transport. And there are uh, certain uh, other proteins uh, called the uh, exporters. Okay. So NS, NXF1, NXT1, these are exporters of uh, mRNP particles. They interact with this uh, Fg domain of the Fg nucleoporins on one hand. And uh, on the other hand, it uh, interacts with uh, these REF and other adapter proteins. You may remember REF. Uh, in the context of SR proteins, you know, like this uh, 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 ex exonic uh, splicing enhancers. Uh, 
the DNA the sequences within exon to which these SR proteins uh, bind. So F is an SR protein and they are part of the exon junction complex. Okay, so then this uh, NXF1, NXT1, they bind to components of the nuclear pore complex on the one hand and <coughs> Uh, the components of MN, uh, M, uh, RNPs like REF and other adapter proteins on the other hand, and it helps in the process of uh, transport of the, the mRNP from the nucleus to the uh, cytosol. Now, uh, you know, in the process, as you can imagine, that uh, as I said uh, in the last class also, that the mRNAs in the cell is never it never exists as uh, you know the just uh, naked mrna it is always covered with proteins and uh, the proteins that it is covered with uh, it varies with, depending on whether it is present in the nucleus or in the cytosol so just to give you an example the mrnp in the nucleus the cap on the mrna is uh, bound by a cap binding complex in the nucleus while it is bound by EIF40 in the cytosol. Uh, the poly A binding protein, uh, you know, in the olden days, the nomenclature was that in the nucleus, it is bound by poly A binding protein 2. Remember, uh, when we talked about poly A denylation, poly A binding protein 2 uh, enhances uh, poly A polymerase activity. And now uh, the terms that are used is uh, uh, poly A binding protein N, nucleus 1 and poly A binding protein C, okay, uh, uh, in the cytoplasmic one. In yeast though, there is just one poly A binding protein, and nonetheless. So this kind of exchange of proteins happen, remodeling happens, and the, then therefore the question comes up that uh, how does the remodeling happen? You, you can see that these, uh, the exporters, the, the, the REF, the adapter proteins, they all are dislodged and they are trafficked back to the nucleus, while in the cytosol, uh, mRNA is decorated with a completely different set of proteins, and then they do their job. Now, the, uh, of course, this is a very detailed, there are a lot of studies done uh, the, uh, there, but you know, I, I'll, I'm giving you a very brief overview as it is there in your textbook. Uh, so one remodeling uh, mechanism that is known is uh, also uh, facilitates uh, unidirectional transfer of mRNPs from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And very interestingly, it is coupled with a surveillance mechanism. Let us try to understand how it works. So uh, there is one uh, protein, which is also an, uh, uh, like a SR protein called NPL3. Uh, NPL3 is phosphorylated on the uh, mRNP of a pre-mRNA. And it remains phosphorylated till the time uh, the poly, like the uh, uh, the polyadenylation process has happened. Once the polyadenylation happens, then uh, it recruits a dephosphorylase, and NPL3 is dephosphorylated. And interestingly, only the dephosphorylated NPL3 can interact with the exporters NXF1 and NXT1. And then only it can come out of the nucleus. So, so just try to understand it another time that for the mRNP to come to the cytosol, you need the exporters. The exporters are NXF1 and NXT1. The exporter for this particular uh, example that we are talking about, the exporter cannot touch itself to the mRNP complex until and unless NPL3 is dephosphorylated. And NPL3 gets dephosphorylated only when poly polyadenylation happens. Therefore, dephosphorylation of NPL3 is a signal that the mRNA has matured. And then it comes out in the cytosol. As soon as it comes out in the cytosol, there is uh, another kinase uh, which phosphorylates NPL3. And once it is phosphorylated, then it ejects the exporter protein in XF1 and XT1 
they go back to the nucleus and the mRNA does its job in the cytosol, you know, it gets translated and stuff like that. <clears throat> so uh, you see that how, this is an example that how RNA processing and the fidelity of the uh, process uh, and gatekeeping function is coupled with the unidirectional transport of the uh, mRNA, okay? Um, there is also evidence that uh, until and unless splicing is proper, uh, an mRNA cannot be transported to the cytosol. Uh, experiments that were done is very cool that you construct an artificial construct with one intron, okay? Um, then in the intron, you remember that there are two conserved residues on the five prime end and two on the, the, the three prime end. If you mutate either one, just on the five prime end, then uh, the mRNP cannot be transported to the cytosol. If you mutate the one only on the three prime end, it cannot be transported to the cytosol. But if you uh, mutate on both the sides, then it can be exported to the cytosol. What it indicates is that as long as the intron region is recognized as an intron, because uh, either one will recruit, you know, if you remember there's a UPF uh, like the, uh, the UPF1, UPF2, et cetera. If either of the complexes is recruited, uh, then it is marked as an RNA that is supposed to undergo splicing. But because if both the ends are not marked, then the actual splicing cannot happen. But just because it is marked for splicing, the export mechanism will not allow it to come out of the nucleus to the cytosol. But if both the uh, conservation residues on both the three prime end and five prime end are mutated, then the, uh, the cellular machinery has no way of knowing what stretch was supposed to be an intron. And therefore, the whole thing comes out. Of course, with the lower efficiency, but it does come out, okay? <clears throat> In thalassemia, I'm sure many of you know about this uh, disease, the genetically inherited disease of the uh, like disorder of the blood. Uh, in uh, thalassemia, uh, like uh, there are certain cases of thalassemia where the loss in beta globin production is basically due to a defect in uh, splice site, like the splice site is mutated. So there is no problem with the actual coding region, but because the splice site is mutated, therefore uh, less globin RNA is available in the cytosol for transcription and therefore for, for translation and therefore the, the patients suffer from thalassemia, okay? Now, you know, generally speaking that if an RNA is transcribed, it comes out to the cytosol, okay? It is uh, very few examples of this are there for regulation. But one particular process the moment I will elaborate it to you, you will realize that regulation must be there. That is retroviral genome. Think about it, what happens when the retrovirus infects, then the RNA is imported into the nucleus uh, through reverse transcription and cDNA is generated, a complementary DNA is generated, which gets integrated into the genome. Right? And then uh, it produces the viral proteins. But remember that viruses also infect from one uh, patient to the other, or from one cell to the other. Therefore, and for that, the RNA genome has to be packaged. Okay? So think now what is happening, that in the nucleus, you have this, uh, the, the, like uh, the DNA version of the RNA genome, uh, integrated in the chromosome. And from there, first a 9KB unspliced uh, mRNA is transcribed. This 9KB unspliced mRNA is the same thing as the RNA genome for the retrovirus. So for the retrovirus to jump from one cell to the other, this must be packaged in the virus, uh, as a virus. But uh, this is unspliced, right? So if it is spliced, then 
there is no way it can be packaged and even if it is packaged it cannot act as an infectious particle right therefore a mechanism has to be there for this unspliced rna to come out of the nucleus not only this uh, uh, after removal of one exon uh, hiv uh, rna makes a 4kb transcript which also uh, uh, comes out in the cytosol and then the most uh, uh, processed version is a 2kb uh, spliced uh, version which has undergone multiple splicing and that produces uh, uh, all sorts of viral proteins okay so viral proteins are made from here from here and from here okay so the question though is that how is it possible that this and this uh, unspliced uh, rnas uh, come out in the cytosol so uh, research has revealed that there is a stretch in the rna sequence which is shown here in the genomic copy called rave response element okay if you generate a mutant hiv which does not have this particular sequence rave response element then uh, the viral particle is non infectious okay like it cannot infect from one cell to the uh, next <clears throat> and to this rave response element binds a protein that is encoded by the viral genome called rave protein this in the initial round after transcription this 9kb or the 4kb ones they cannot come to the cytosol what comes out is the 2kb spliced version which makes many proteins including the rave protein this rave protein then goes inside the nucleus and binds its own rna the hiv rna at the rrd sequence and uh, this one has a very strong uh, export uh, ability it uh, interacts with uh, the exporting not the nxf1 or nxt1 but it uh, binds an exporter called exportin and it comes out okay so that's what is shown here that uh, this uh, 9kb or the 4kb1 they can come out if and only if the rave protein is present without the rave protein they cannot come out Okay. So this is a fantastic example uh, of regulated RNA export, and also gives you an insight into how smart the viral uh, uh, molecular biology is. That uh, it has created a very specialized mechanism altogether to overcome the surveillance of the nuclear export uh, mechanism of mRNAs. and allow uh, packaging of the viral genome uh, for making infectious viral particles right okay so that's all that uh, i wanted to talk to you about uh, export and now i will uh, talk about another post transcriptional regulation that we mentioned in the very first uh, lecture in this series is stability of the rna okay certain rnas uh, like in general uh, in mammalian cells uh, rnas have a half life of few hours okay but all rnas cannot have such long half life you know like uh, rnas that encode uh, cytokines you know cytokines are supposed to act in a burst and then go away of course there are mechanisms for the cytokines to be degraded so the proteins are degraded but if the rna uh, and of course there is mechanism to turn off their transcription but if the rna has long half life then it can continue to make the protein therefore there are mechanisms to degrade the rna also faster so this is a regulated process and uh, you know i i do not know about the detail that uh, what dictates certain rna will have longer half life than the other uh, often it is uh, dictated by the length of the poly a tail okay so uh yeah uh yeah so the what happens is that uh, naturally the poly a tail length is uh, shortened to some extent and then once it is uh, shortened then uh, so as i told you earlier that uh, though mrna is a linear molecule but what happens is that in the cell the mrna kind of uh, exists as a non covalently circularized uh, structure now because of interaction between proteins that are bound to the cap 
uh, like EIF 4 e and then you will see 4B, 4G, etc., and poly A binding protein. Now, if the poly A tail length is shortened, then in this interaction is lost. Now the cap structure is uh, you know, at one end. Once the cap structure is at one end, then there are uh, enzymes like uh, decapping enzyme one and two, they can simply remove the cap. And once that is removed, then there is an exonucleus, which has five prime to three prime processing activity, and it can degrade the RNA. Okay. Uh, similarly, once the polyethyl length is uh, shortened enough, then the, there are uh, enzymes which are called exosomes that can degrade it from three prime to uh, five prime end. Okay, uh, so this is a deadenylation dependent degradation uh, mechanism. There are deadenylation independent mRNA decay mechanism as well, uh, where you know the same decapping enzymes it just removes the cap, and then uh, you know uh, uh, it is uh, degraded from the five prime to three prime uh, manner. And the worst case scenario is that presence of endonucleases. The endonuclease will simply chop the RNA from the middle. And once it is chopped, then in this direction, it is a substrate for XRN1, the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease. And in this direction, it is a substrate for the exosome uh, in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So it is very rapid decay of the mRNA that happens. And uh, you know, like there is a specialized uh, structure, uh, non-membrane bound structure within eukaryotic cells called the P-bodies which is rich in these components that uh, can degrade RNA. Okay. Um, there is another very interesting mechanism of um, RNA decay, okay, which is called nonsense mediated RNA decay. Now, this, I will not get into the detail, not that you know I am an expert on this either, uh, but uh, you know, I thought that you should at least know what it means. <clears throat> so let us understand the term nonsense mediated decay. So this nonsense refers to nonsense codon. Okay. Generally speaking, the stop codon is after the is in the last exon. Generally, for most of the RNA that you will survey, you will find the stop codon in the last exon. But if it is not in the last exon, then it becomes part of a surveillance uh, mechanism. Okay, it becomes subject to a surveillance mechanism because, say, for some reason, there is an erroneous uh, transcription, and because of that, a nonsense codon has been introduced in an otherwise normal mRNA. And then this can make uh, aberrant protein, which can be deleterious. So there is a surveillance mechanism to remove that. So how does that surveillance mechanism work? Remember when splicing happens, then two exons are joined together, right? And there are proteins that are deposited at the exon-exon junction. These are called exon junction uh, complex. The exon junction complex has uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, uh, proteins that are uh, deposited on it. In the first round of translation, the pioneering round of translation, the ribosome moves and it knocks off all these proteins. But if there is a premature termination codon, which is shown here as PTC, then the ribosome will not get an opportunity to reach up to this spot. So it cannot uh, dislodge it because the ribosome will fall off right here. And if it falls off right there, then presence of this exon junction complex on the mRNA after the pioneering round of translation is an indication that if there is a premature termination codon here, and that leads to formation of uh, some specialized complexes. I am not getting into the detail and the mRNA is degraded. That is what is referred to as premature nonsense mediated decay. Now, certain mRNAs naturally can have their stop codon in the last but one exon or the exon before that, and they will naturally have a, uh, a shorter half-life, simply because they will be subject to NMD pathway. Um, now, 
this uh, relationship with exon junction complex has recently been challenged and says that it is not that exon junction complex uh, uh, presence of exon junction complex on the RNA uh, subjects is to NMD. Rather, the distance between the termination codon and the polyjet tail that dictates it. Now, uh, both these models are now contested, and I think the last word is uh, yet to be out. But the bottom line remains uh, the same: that if there are translation stop codon in the exon before the last exon, then those mRNAs generally will have a shorter half-life because of NMD-mediated uh, uh, degradation. Now I will come to the last topic in uh, uh, post-translational modification, which is, uh, you all know about it, microRNA and siRNA-mediated degradation. What you may not know, I do not know, like how uh, you have studied it earlier, is that how the mechanism was first uh, discovered? Hold on. How was it first discovered? So, the first observation, relevant observation, was made in 1990. There was this company, you can see that this is a, not an academic lab, it's a company. They were trying to make more attractive uh, petunia plants, okay? So petunia flower, they can have a very bright violet color. They wanted to make it more bright. So the gene that is responsible for the color formation, like uh, um, chalcone synthase, they simply wanted to overexpress that gene in the genetically modified plant. And to their surprise, what they found is that upon overexpression of the gene, there is a loss of function. You know, the fl flowers lost their color. That was an observation which they could not uh, explain. Okay, uh, but they reported it nonetheless. A similar phenomenon was observed in Neurospora crassa in 1992 that uh, overexpression of a gene actually caused loss of function of the gene. In animals, the first example of uh, RNA interference that was reported was from Kemfuse's lab. Uh, you know, it's a paper, Go and Kemfuse, G-U-O, Go and Kemfuse. You can uh, read it. And I will show you the schematic of it in uh, a few slides. The most interesting one was uh, reported from Victor Ambrose's lab. Victor Ambrose was uh, studying uh, lineage uh, determination in C. elegans. Okay. Now, in C. elegans, the genes that are involved in lineage determination, they are called LIN. So LIN14 was a gene that was already known to be important for uh, lineage determination. And uh, Ambrose's lab, discovered a new gene called LIN4. And they also uh, concluded that it encodes a small RNA, which has antisense complementarity to the three prime UTR region of LIN14. They observed all of that, but they did not uh, connect the dots. So but to summarize their paper, they reported that LIN4 transcript is only 22 or 261 nucleotides long. It blocks expression of LIN14 protein. And LIN14 3' prime UTR has seven repeat sequences that are complementary to LIN4 sequence. So they made all these observations. But they did not address the mechanism of action in that uh, paper. And uh, this was published in uh, um, This was published in 1993. Okay, so that, that happened. So you see, like 1990, the Petunia, 1992, the Neurospora Crassa report came out, and 93, uh, this Lin4, Lin14 paper came out, 94, uh, Go and Kemfuse paper came out. But nobody, you know, really uh, addressed the mechanism, nobody paid much attention to it. And that's where a prepared mind comes in play. So 
comes in the picture is Andrew Fire and Craig Bello. Andrew Fire, uh, I have not uh, uh, included that in my presentation here. Andrew Fire conducted his PhD research in UK, where he was uh, one of the part of one of the groups that was working on antisense RNA mediated uh, uh, interference, like uh, when even when I was starting my PhD career, like in 95 or around, um, antisense RNA-mediated loss of function was quite a popular tool. Andrew Fire's lab in C. elegans was uh, using that as a, or developing that as a tool rather, okay? Uh, and if you read that paper published in 1991, they made, transgenic animals with uh, which would express antisense uh, like like you know like, just uh, uh, let us say that this is a gene okay five ten to three pi okay. so if you simply clone it, like this, then it is uh, three prime to five prime. So if you have the promoter right over here, you will produce inside the cell the antisense version of it, right? So they were making uh, worms which had constructs like this. And they were obtaining loss of function phenotype. But as we do, we always have controls, okay? So they had some uh, worms where the gene was inserted in the five prime to three prime direction. Normally, they did not expect any phenotype in there. But if you read the paper, they actually reported that they observed phenotype with the same loss of function phenotype over there as well. But you know, like it was in the development stage of the technology, they did not uh, emphasize much on it. And uh, you know, I guess the reviewers also did not bother. The paper was published, but Andrew Fire did not forget that. So if you look at his, like if you uh, listen to his uh, Nobel lecture, he actually mentioned about his 1991 paper that when he was trying to uh, conduct loss of function for a particular gene uh, called ANC22, uh, the, then uh, they observed that with the antisense, of course they were getting interference, but with the sense also they were getting interference and they were using transgenic worms, okay? like uh, these were randomly integrated into the worm genome, the constructs, okay? And Kempfuse's lab, they made RNA in vitro. If they made RNA in vitro in the, like antisense direction, of course they, uh, and then they injected the RNA in the worm gonad, they got interference. If they made RNA in vitro in the sense direction either, they got interference then as well. So, you know, in a Cold Spring Harbor meeting uh, around, I think, 95, Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, they met in a Cold Spring Harbor meeting. And the Cold Spring Harbor is a very popular uh, venue for uh, scientific meetings in the US. Uh, yeah. And they asked themselves these questions that, how could both the sense and antisense RNA produce interference? And, <clears throat> RNAs are generally not known to have a very long half-life. You know, we just talked about the condition, right? But uh, these uh, injected RNAs seem to be outlasting the life of the normal RNAs. So, you know, how is this possible? So they came up with this idea that is the interfering RNA a contaminant with a stable structure? Like it is not really the sensor or antisense RNA that they are injecting, but there is some contaminant in there which is responsible for uh, you know this interference and this thing has a stable structure. So they designed their own experiments. They paid special attention to ensure that the RNA that they are making in the sense or antisense direction are very pure, pure sense RNA or pure antisense RNA, or they will anneal them together to make uh, double-stranded RNA. 
and uh, then they saw that yes with just sense or anti sense they are not getting very severe phenotype but if they first annihilate or even if they don't annihilate they inject the sense and the anti sense together uh, they will they were getting uh, phenotype in the worm and then they did another very interesting experiment that what they did is to visualize uh, this interference real time what they did is they constructed two different transgenic worms no uh, the same worm has two different transgenic constructs what are these two constructs you know, like uh, behind their gene of interest you know like uh, here you have the promoter enhancer etc there is a gfp with its own nuclear localization signal and it is fused with lacsi the other one exactly the same promoter enhancer gfp but instead of a nuclear localization signal it will be mitochondrial localization signal so depending on whether the gfp is in the nucleus or in the mitochondria you can tell which uh, construct uh, it came from right now what they observed so if they used double stranded interference constructs from the gfp part versus the lacsi part please remember that this if they target the lacsi part only the nuclear gfp will be targeted and not the mitochondrial gfp because this is not there right so what they found is that if they used a double stranded rna against the gfp part then whether it is the nuclear or the mitochondrial one they, they are all getting depleted some cells uh, you know they found for strange reason to be resistant but if they target the lacsi part then the nuclear uh, expression is gone but the mitochondrial expression survives so they knew that it is a like a sequence specific Uh, interference that they are looking at and then finally they actually uh, made double stranded rna construct against uh, a particular gene called mex3 and by conducting rna in situ hybridization in first cell stage uh, c ligands embryo they showed that you know if you have the double stranded rna then uh, it completely uh, degrades uh, the actual rna okay? like when there is no double stranded rna no probe obviously no rna in situ signal no double stranded rna mex3 probe of course you will get intense mex3 signal but if you only have anti sense rna you still get quite decent mex3 signal but if you have double stranded rna then even if you add probe you get no signal so uh, you know um, they demonstrated that the double stranded rna actually depletes the target mrna okay? and then they have done lot of different experiments and they showed that the double stranded rna is 100 fold more effective than either the sense or the anti sense and even if there are few molecules of double stranded rna it can produce uh, the interference effect and uh, that's the reason this experiment was important is because they originally uh, hypothesized that in kemfuse's experiment there was uh, some contaminating double stranded uh, rna which actually caused the trouble and uh, to demonstrate that they had to show that even at a very low dosage double stranded rna can cause interference right so you know like the overall they in inferred that uh, you know uh, is uh, must be a post transcriptional mechanism as double stranded rna corresponding to introns did not produce any uh, phenotype okay so it's a post transcriptional uh, mechanism okay? so happening in the cytosol uh, uh, and then they reported that the actual decrease in rna levels the uh, the mex3 experiment and the double stranded uh, effect goes beyond the cell and can be transmitted to the next generation you know subsequent papers have shown that in uh, many cases uh, even in chick the the there are examples uh, there are experimental data that suggests that uh, upon rna inter like say you know there is a, a population of four cells okay and then only in this cell uh, the 
double standard interfering RNA was actually introduced, but you got knocked down even in this cell. The only way it can be explained is that the interference mechanism itself is prepared producing agents that can again cause interference and which can diffuse from one cell type to the other. There are many papers uh, out there. You know, and uh, do you know what they do nowadays? Uh, nowadays, uh, for C. elegans, uh, what they do is they simply make uh, recombinant bacteria. Okay, um, there, you know, P. blue script type vector engineered in a manner that on both the ends you have T7 RNA. Okay. So now the gene that is uh, in here, it will be transcribed both in the sense direction as well as in the antisense direction. And that will be produced inside the bacteria. And then they feed C. elegans on this bacteria and interference happens. It's a very uh, elegant and simple mechanism. Uh, in fact, this is the method that is used for conducting large-scale uh, genetic screens in uh, C. elegans, for large-scale loss of function screens in C. elegans. Anyway, so what is the molecular mechanism? This you know better than I do, I'm pretty sure, because I, I do not remember the nitty-gritty as well, but I'm sure you do. So there are two different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, interference mechanism that is known now. One is called the microRNA mechanism and the other is siRNA. The microRNA, there the complementarity between the small RNA and the mRNA is not 100%. There are some kinks and that primarily results in translation inhibition, okay? And if there is a perfect complementarity between the small RNA and the target mRNA, then it generally leads to cleavage of the uh, target mRNA. And, uh, but both the cases, you end up having uh, a loss of function. Um, how are these uh, species produced? So, you know, like uh, these are transcribed by all to transcript only. Um, you know, one day I can tell you all the stories uh, because, you know, I was uh, a like when this uh, work actually uh, became very prominent, I was doing my postdoctoral work and we were all trying to adopt this for our own work. And there was all sorts of uh, theories that were floating around. Uh, so we were initially making these with Paul three uh, 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 promoters and stuff like that. But eventually now it is known that uh, you know, Paul two trans uh, these are Paul two transcripts. And then the, primary uh, microRNA is made, which is, uh, you know, by the action of uh, DROSA and uh, another protein called DCR8, uh, DGCR8, uh, the uh, primary RNA, microRNA is converted to pre-microRNA, which is basically a, a stem and loop structure, uh, which comes out in the cytosol, and their dicer acts on it and uh, produces the actual uh, double standard uh, you know, active entity. Remember, um, Victor Ambrose reported that LIN4 exists either as a 22 nucleotide or a 61 nucleotide uh, moiety. So this is your 61 nucleotide moiety, this is your 21 nucleotide moiety, okay? So then that is incorporated in the risk complex. And this risk complex, is the uh, actual entity that uh, does the interference. So here it is shown uh, schematically very nicely. <laughs> that whether it is, <laughs> sorry, whether it is the microRNA or the siRNA mechanism, they both converge onto the dicer and eventually dicer incorporates uh, the single strand and then that, uh, does the interference with the, by translational liberation or by mRNA cleavage. So one of my uh, postdoctoral lab mates, um, he uh, was in the lab of Andrew Fire. So he was very excited about this whole thing and he decided to uh, knock out dicer. So he thought that it will have some developmental uh, effect. But um, that did not really happen because uh, this, Every molecule of 
uh, the RNAi pathway is critically important for the survival of the organism. You know, like these are essential genes. So uh, you mutate dicer, animals will be dead. So he did a limb specific dicer knockout and you know, he got dysmorphic limb, but not it is not particularly uh, informative. But one thing that you should uh, know and note is that um, discovery of the entire RNAi pathway, you know, in the original paper by Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, they only knew that a double standard RNA can do interference. This discovery of Grossa, Dicer, etc., etc., those were not achieved through genetic screens. Why? Because any genetic screen that would impair the RNAi mechanism, see genetic screens are done like that, right? So you want to look for loss of function. So any genetic, uh, mut any mutation that will impair the, the RNAi pathway is actually deleterious. The animals are dead. <clears throat> Therefore, um, other than one uh, gene that Craig Miller discovered through genetic screen, uh, genetic screens were not very helpful in discovering the entire pathway. In fact, the whole work was done biochemically. I'm forgetting the name of that person. I actually had a, uh, like uh, now that I'm uh, talking about uh, microRNA and siRNA in uh, 20 minute uh, of a 40 minute lecture. <laughs> We actually had a five or six lecture series just uh, talking on this. If any of you are interested, I can supply you all the papers and those slides, etc., cetera, um, for you to study on your own. And there you will find uh, the references to all the original biochemical work, how they discovered each and every component of uh, the uh, RNA mechanism. But you know, uh, at least uh, you now know that something that was discovered in uh, 1998, uh, you know, this uh, nature paper that we talked about, um, you know that this is one Nobel winning paper, right? And um, this year, uh, uh, the uh, CRISPR-Cas mechanism got the Nobel Prize. So uh, in a span of uh, 20 years, two different uh, mechanisms, both involving, uh, you know, uh, RNA regulated, uh, you know, molecular biological techniques uh, attracted uh, uh, recognition by the Nobel Committee. Okay, so uh, I thought that I should just point it out. That's all about uh, post-transcriptional regulation. Thank you. Thank you.